Good day chaps, so today's video is going to be a quick one and it's discussing the tank you all love to hate, the Covenanter and more to the point, why it isn't as bad as you might think it was or at least it served another purpose. The A13 Mark III Covenanter or Cruiser Tank Mark V named after the Covenanters, a breakaway religious group in Scotland in the 17th century was a fast cruiser tank built during the Second World War Despite having a lower mark number than the Crusader, the vehicle was not a precursor to the Crusader and both Covenanter and Crusader were built at more or less the same time due to Lord Nuffield's belligerence and the Covenanter is the first of the cruisers to take the sea-based name, a tradition that would last until today. Covenanter's origins lie with a requirement set by the War Office in 1938 for a new armoured cruiser tank to replace the cruiser Mark IV. Nuffield submitted the A16 design, but this was found to be too expensive, and the general staff required a well armoured machine of around 30mm with a good gun and to utilise Christie type suspension, such as that found on the A13. The tender was put out to different firms, but the War Office also made a request for other industrial companies to submit their designs. These were commonly railway and heavy industry plants. There was, of course, a very good reason for this. With the war being inevitable in the eyes of many, it was very important that these civilian factories were able to retool and staff up for wartime production. This was a very important step and often overlooked when people complain why a train factory would be making tanks in the first place. But one should remember that they have all the right ingredients to start producing tanks, with the transport links, experience with heavy plant equipment, working steel, riveting and space and many tank factories today started off as manufacturers of trains and ships. This would see various companies from Rolls-Royce, Leylands, Birmingham Motor and Carriage, Ruston and Hornsby, Vauxhalls and the London Midland and Scottish Railway Carriage Company or LMS as well as English Electric take part in tank design or engineering parts of tanks throughout the war alongside the more traditional builders like Nuffields and Vickers. LMS set to designing a new tank and despite no previous experience in tank building their design was on layout exceptional for the time. Compared to those that had gone previously it had a low profile which in itself is the best form of defence as the saying goes you cannot kill that which you cannot hit. It made a good use of the armour allocated with well sloped plates to reach the required line of sight thickness and yet still hit the criteria and the two pounder gun mounted was able to perforate almost any enemy tank it might come across and a good turn of speed with four man crew. The original vehicle was to be of a welded design not a riveted design thus saving weight again. So far so good then. In fact the plans looked so good and with the war almost a certainty the war office ordered the machine straight into production and this is where the first mistakes occur. Now as to why the Covey's low profile and mobility, something desirable in a cruiser tank, was primarily through a new engine, the water-cooled Meadows DAV flat 12, 340 horsepower. This was a low profile engine in a flat configuration, which in turn lowered the profile of the tank. And this engine really was very flat. But this produced its own problems, as the radiators could not be placed above it and so a rather unorthodox design move was taken to place the radiators on the front of the tank. Now this is not as uncommon as one might think, or even as problematic. In fact many vehicles today have radiators to the front, but they also importantly have the engine to the front as well, and this was not the case with the Covey. The water was pumped back via pipes to the engine to cool it, but the problem lay with both the pipe width and the fans. These were too small for the required amount of water to be pumped back to the engine in the volume and rate needed, resulting in overheating and breakdowns when in continuous use. The water thus became very hot, which radiated its heat both externally and internally. So this was the first issue. It wasn't the location of the radiator or the engine itself, but was down to the flow of cooling and inadequate fans. But why was the engine overheating in the first place? Well that problem lay in the choice of metals to be used. The designers had envisioned the use of aluminium in many parts, including the running gear to save weight. 
while the hull was to be of a welded construction. However, the Royal Air Force got quite uppity by this, as they felt that such materials were needed by themselves over tanks, and they had the political influence to ensure this was the case. This resulted in the Covenanter being made more in line with other tanks at the time, and added extra weight to the vehicle. They also had the issue of steel. The British made good use of Vickers face hardened steel plate. This was done by heating the metal over bone charcoal to surface harden one face. But while it produces hard tempered steel, it is not possible to weld such materials, and so they used a bolt and rivet technique as the LMS had experience in riveting trains and switched to this method. This required the harder outer plates to be bolted onto a more ductile endoskeleton, which while having some benefits weighed more than was desired. This in turn put more strain on the engine. The next problem lay with the changes from the general staff who wanted more armour than 30mm, up to 40mm, which further increased the weight of the tank. These factors together added strain on the engine that it was not designed for. This made it run hot and with poor cooling would cause it to break down. Now oddly it didn't break down as much in the UK as folks might like to think. And that's because all it ever does here is rain normally. But by the time the vehicle was begun to put into service, the tank war was taking place in North Africa. And a tank that ran hot here would be completely unusable there. Although two were sent out for trials with King Force near Cairo. Other problems also added to its woes. The transmission was changed from a combined Wilson transmission and the steering affected production. The A13 crash gearbox was used with epicyclic steering units and this meant that the fans for the transmission were also inadequate and caused problems there too. Other problems were minor. The original early vehicles had a machine gun fitted to the driver's compartment but this was near impossible to use and drive at the same time and even so had a poor arc of fire and was later just dropped altogether. So what have we established so far? Well, the fault lay with the changes between the design and the product, in which a good design was not flexible enough to change with the shifting desires of the general staff, something that still affects tank design today. The second major problem was rushing things to the production stage. This is generally a bad move, as it doesn't allow time to establish faults. But it could be understood as the Germans were on the doorstep. So why is it not as bad as it's often made out to be? Because the Covenanter also provided other roles that, are in my opinion, go some way to redeeming it, and that is one of propaganda, morale, and deceit. The Covey played an important role often overlooked by some, and that is on the home front effort. With the UK losing the Battle of France and its retreat from Dunkirk, much of its equipment was left behind. Admittedly, much of that equipment was also useless. So if there is a silver lining, it's that they were able to resupply with new tanks on a much larger scale than might have been the case, as many factories were now set to a wartime footing with all the tooling and training they might require ready to roll out. The UK, though, was under a great deal of fear that of a German invasion, and it was felt by many in the UK this would be the case, with the population beginning massive construction works into bunkers, pillboxes, while Home Guard regiments were formed, while the British government tried to get a Lend-Lease deal sorted with the US. This worked, and the UK began to receive a number of American tanks, and the RAF, although at a heavy cost, had given Fritz a good duffing over in the Battle of Britain. And the UK was not sitting idle, taking the fight to North Africa, where it needed every bit of equipment it could get. So what was the Covenanter doing in all this? Well, its role was one of training and propaganda. Over 1,700 vehicles were made, and these were used for a wide variety of training roles, from driver training, formation practice, and gunnery, down to engineering practice and anti-tank training. This had the major benefit that every combat-worthy tank we produced could be almost immediately shipped to where it was needed. Shermans, Matildas, and Crusaders were boxed up and sent to the fighting fronts, and not necessarily used up in large numbers at home, because those roles had been filled. Those crews trained on the Covenanter would find Crusader very similar in layout, and, to be honest, in reliability. Engineers and electricians and mechanics had a steady supply to train on, with no massive worries that the vehicles might be needed elsewhere, and many were trained on these vehicles because they were difficult to work with, and that made the real thing somewhat easier. Train hard, play easy. So this was the first real use of Covenanter, 
And while it could be argued that producing an unreliable tank was not the best way to do it, this was very much a case of what was done was done. But the more important role was also propaganda. With a fearful population, the government set to show its resolve and its capability as much as possible. To this end, there's a huge amount of surviving pictures of Covenanters compared to other vehicles of the time. In newspapers, magazines, press photos, schools and factory visits, Covenanters were sent far and wide to bolster morale that the government had the tanks and the will to keep fighting. After all, the public itself had no idea about their reliability issues. Large formation manoeuvres were undertaken and the press invited to witness and take pictures of these. One of the more commonly seen images of Covenanters is also on war flats or train carriages. When image searching, many photos will display these press images with large lines of tanks at sidings, and this served two purposes. The tanks were loaded up onto several lines, notably the Dorset and Northern Line, and sent up and down the country during daylight hours, with no tarpaulins or attempts to cover them. Upon reaching their designation, they were unloaded and reloaded, helping with the training, but more importantly, shuffling the numbers and identifying marks, and were then sent back down the lines. This bolstered the public morale, who would have seen regular long lines of tanks going past and been well assured that they were protected. Many regular tanks that were to be sent for combat were moved at night under tarpaulins and covers to hide numbers from enemy agents, yet the covies were sent by daytime on purpose. If anybody was sitting there taking notes on numbers and locations and feeding that information back to the enemy, he would be alarmed by how many tanks the UK was producing and moving with each haul, and these were reshuffled and sent back down which would further exaggerate their numbers. Thus to an enemy spy, the UK had a huge number of tanks based across the nation. So these were two great uses of the Covenanter. It served to bolster morale, to assure the public they were protected, and to train the soldiers at home, and make sure that the vital war supplies were quickly dispatched to where they were needed, earning it, in my opinion, some reprieve. Add in the fact that the rival vehicle, such as the Crusader, was barely an improvement in overall reliability, with at one point over 200 hours required on each vehicle before they were even operational, and the Churchill had so many faults that it was considered a disaster, then one could be more forgiving. The Covey also provided plentiful hulls and new ideas to be tested on, from mine flails and rollers, bridge launchers and amphibious tanks such as the AT-1, but we will save those for another video. Well guys, hopefully this makes you see the Covenant in a slightly different light, or maybe give it a bit of a break. It might not have won glory abroad, but it served faithfully back home and ensured the population kept calm and carried on. Today there are two surviving Covenanter tanks, one at the Bobbington Tank Museum and another in a private collection which was dug up a few years ago and the link to their Facebook group is below in the description. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed this. If you did, give us a like and a subscribe and uh, let us know your feedback below. Until next time, toodle pip.